everyone. I'm so excited to start the fourth session of this conference. We have a great panel for this um, for this session. So the first presentation will be by um, Stephanie Shady, who is a PhD candidate at UNC Chapel Hill in comparative politics. And her research and teaching focuses on uh, social identities, political behavior, national identity, religion, the EU. And her dissertation have been, is a place on earth, religion, and the politics of territorial identity, examines uh, the way individuals use religion um, to conceptualize boundaries. And the first article of this is published in the West European politics. And, oh, Ed, sorry, does she want, I'm trying to figure out, does she want to go or should I introduce all of them? I can't remember. Go ahead and do all of them. Okay, okay, I just want to make sure. Okay. And our second panelist, Arcien Bonnet, or Bonner, she is a UNC freshman from Charlotte, North Carolina. So that's awesome that she's a freshman doing this. She is a UNC NUS double degree student majoring in global studies with a focus on Asia and global health and environment. And she's also double minoring in medical anthropology and conflict management. She, on top of that, is on the pre-med track and she would like to pursue a career in humanitarian work in medicine. And third, uh, our third presentation is Maria, is by Maria Cardimitri Stapelfeld. And she was born in Greece and she graduated in political science and history at the Pante Pantheon University in Athens. And after completing her studies, she did an internship in Rotterdam in the Netherlands. And she's been um, living and working in Berlin after, since 2013. And she's currently completing her master's degree in poli sci at Free University of Berlin. So let's give it up for our panel. Great. Uh, thank you so much. Um, so today I want to talk about um, church state relations in Europe and how they're still relevant for thinking about socio-political um, divides and contestation today. Um, and specifically, I'm going to talk about how religion policy is one way that subnational political elites um, can contest the meaning of subnational and national identities um, and seek tangible devolution of their authority. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, okay, um, so I'll just briefly touch on this. This is from the first part of my dissertation. Um, Europe gets a reputation as being um, secular because of declining church attendance, um, but it has a lot of importance today um, in more implicit ways as a community builder, um, bringing people together as a moral foundation. Um, and I find in my first um, part of my dissertation that there's still this relationship between people who were raised in the majority religion of their country and having stronger national identity um, compared to people who were not raised in a religion or who were raised in a minority tradition. Um, but I don't find that behaviors like church attendance or prayer um, or thinking that you're a more religious person um, affect that relationship. So we can see that religion is still affecting socio um, and political context in Europe, but not in the traditional way we think about religion and political behavior. You can go to the next slide. Um, so traditionally church state relations have been thought of at the national level in three different ways um, that are pretty broad. Either there's an official state church like the Anglican church, or this is really common in um, Protestant majority um, countries in Northern Europe. Um, secularism, the quintessential case here would be France, um, kind of a clear position of separation of church and state, or concordatarian, which means that the government is signing agreements um, with different organizations that represent religious traditions. Um, and this affords them certain things of, like tax benefits or access of religious leaders to public institutions, um, such as schools or hospitals um, or military for chaplaincy type work. Um, most places that have an official state church or an official policy of secularism still have some concordatarian elements. It's just that the nature 
of those relationships might be different. And there's often a different agreement between the historically majority tradition um, and minority religions. So a good example is um, the French relationship with the Catholic Church. There are um, basically because Catholic churches were the only historically existent um, churches at the time of some legal changes, um, they get benefits from the state, even though it's a secular state, um, for preserving historic art or architecture. Um, but there's a lot more variation in church government relations when we get down to the subnational level. Um, and both historically and in contemporary politics, religion policy can be used to distinguish um, that community from the state and build a, a new idea of identity or what values that community holds. Um, you can go to the next slide. Yes. Um, so political scientists have studied how differences over multiple levels of governance affect um, the center periphery divide between um, peripheral regions and like a center um, capital uh, region intersect with other socio-political divides like the one over church-state relations. Um, the secular clerical divide um, in Europe first occurred in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, um, approximately. Um, but a lot of the scholarship so far really focuses on that national level, even though subnational regions experience this divide differently precisely because of their position um, on the preference for self-governance. Um, so regions experience this divide differently when their religious landscape differed in some way from the state. That could mean that they have a different majority tradition that they practice there, or that they practice the same majority tradition, but in culturally specific ways. Um, and this matters because as I said before, religion is really intertwined with community identity, bringing people together or defining um, morals and values of that community. Um, so if you look at the figure on the screen, at the top you see these historically jointly occurring political divides, the secular clerical, the center periphery, um, and the shapes here, the white are subnational regions and the black are countries. Um, the triangles are France and Alsace-Moselle um, and Spain and Catalonia are the circles. Those are the cases I'll talk about in a minute. Um, but they take different positions on that center periphery divide. And even among those who take the same position, pro-clerical or pro-secular, um, the political elites, um, they're still going to have different ideas about what that issue position means or what that policy outcome is going to be um, because of their preference for who has authority at what level of governance um, should these things be decided. Um, and even though the secular clerical divide is no longer the primary um, thing that European politicians are competing over, we can see it playing out today um, and carrying forward these institutional and behavioral patterns um, because of the growth of a minority religion, um, Islam, um, across Europe. Um, and this could occur in the future with other um, minority populations as well. And so in the presence of these salient ethno-religious identities, um, as it depicted in the bottom half of the figure, um, political elites at the subnational and national level are going to take different positions on um, this divide between multiculturalism and monoculturalism. How do we define our national and subnational community spaces um, in terms of religion, ethnicity, race? Um, and to be clear here, as we've discussed throughout the day, I think that religion nowadays is more of an implicit term. It's a way to talk about race um, without saying it out loud, which is important for political strategy. And that's something I'm hoping to study more in the future. Um, but for subnational elites, the key here is to try to take the opposite position on this multicultural and monocultural divide um, in order to differentiate their community from the national one, to define their subnational community, um, in this case, as more tolerant or more open to religious pluralism and multiculturalism more broadly. Um, so if you go to the next slide, um, I'll talk about one of my examples. Um, and okay, I think this is an older one. Okay, perfect. Um, so I'll talk about the second example a little, in a little bit less detail and we can talk about it in the Q&A if you would like. Um, so thinking about Spain, um, leading up to the Spanish Civil War, which was between 1936 and 1939, um, and then subsequently the Franco dictatorship up until 1975, um, uh, Franco's nationalist forces were really aligned with the Catholic Church um, and other supporters of conservative values with respect to gender roles and class um, and support for the monarchy. 
Um, and there was generally overlap between the opposition, the Republican forces, um, small r Republican, um, and anti-clerical um, sentiment. Um, however, in Catalonia, pro-clerical Catalans distanced themselves from these nationalists because they really tried to keep separate um, the Catalan Catholic Church from the rest of Spain. Um, and we see this theme throughout the Franco dictatorship. Um, so during his regime, um, Franco and the state constructed this idea of a national Catholicism. There was an attempt to create an idea of a unified Spanish identity that really erased various minority cultures, um, such as Basque culture, Catalan culture, et cetera. Um, and so they would use symbols in their propaganda, like um, the Queen Isabella of Aragon, um, who was the queen whenever the kingdoms that make up Spain today um, were first unified, um, and at the same time, um, the kingdom forcibly converted and or banished um, Jews and Muslims um, from the region um, during La Reconquista. Um, and so this idea of both being this ideal Spanish woman and one who brought together um, a, a national Spanish identity and idea of Spain um, was really important to the dictatorship's propaganda. You also saw um, Catholic symbols in the military intertwining um, through um, Catholic rites of uh, funeral rites at military funerals, um, or during the Holy Week parades during the Franco regime, there would be military parades um, simultaneously. Those symbols were, were combined. Um, and finally, Franco appointed non-Catalan bishops to Catalan churches as a way to um, maintain Spanish control of what it meant to be Spanish, what it meant to be Catholic at the same time. But in Catalonia, churches were a source of resistance. Um, so they provided cover throughout the regime for um, various organizations organizing resistance like youth and labor organizations. Um, and then in 1945, when the Vatican and Franco signed an agreement with one another to open relations, um, Catalan priests were among the hunger strike participants. So again, you see this sort of differentiation. Yes, we're Catholic, but we're not just Spanish Catholic, we're Catalan Catholic, and that community is different and it has different values. Um, and so when restrictions started loosening up towards the end of this regime, um, it became possible again to start using regional languages that had previously been banned, um, but only in limited context. Um, so at first you could use Catalan, um, the language in religious services, but not for other, especially political purposes. And so churches started providing youth language classes so that people who grew up during the regime and maybe didn't have access to studying their community's language in school could now go back and learn their community's language. Um, and so this was a way to sort of, again, bind the community and the religion together. Um, so bringing it into towards the present, um, as the democratic transition happened in the 19, late 1970s, um, the new constitution returned some authority to these community um, <clears throat> communities that were distinct from the state um, and also established um, the separation of church and state. But even then, we saw that in the 1980 Religious Liberty Law um, and in the Constitution, there was this recognition that Catholicism had something special about it, that it was historically and socially still important to Spain. And because of that, the Catholic Church has greater benefits than other religious groups do in the country. Um, so for example, when you're filling out your taxes, you can allocate some of that revenue towards the Catholic Church. No other religion has that um, opportunity. Um, and Catalonia is subject to these church state laws, um, including this de facto Catholic privilege, um, but it has its own religious affairs office, as does the city of Barcelona, um, and also authority over education policy. This is one way that they've tried to differentiate themselves. Um, and so, for example, in the 2009 law on worship centers, um, the Catalan parliament recognized um, that there's a growth in religious pluralism. Catalonia is more religious um, than other parts of Spain, um, but less Catholic in terms of percentages of their population. Um, and so they recognized that we needed some sort of form of laicism or secularism, but that, that didn't mean um, <clears throat> absence of religion, it meant absence of government favoritism towards a particular religion. Um, and they defined those values um, in the preamble to this law as intrinsic to Catalan community identity in contrast to the way that 
um, Spanish policies were defining the special rule for Catholicism. Um, so in the quote here, they list um, in the preamble different values that are important to their common space and their society. Um, and they mention things like coexistence, respect for plural, pluralism. Um, and at the end there, they say that these are all things that are important in the national construction of Catalonia. So again, defining that we have these multicultural values, we respect others, um, beliefs, um, and that's important to who we are, even if the Spanish state um, might sometimes differ. Um, and this is not just a government um, nice words at the top. Um, this is also seen in tangible policies um, in Catalonia, as well as in their public opinion. Um, so over 80% of Catalans um, in a recent survey from last or from 2020 um, said that they knew of mosques in their community, um, and two thirds believed that it was important to have knowledge of different religions. Um, and an example of a policy that um, the Barcelona and neighboring towns did um, was in 2008, they started this education program called Places of Worship, Spaces to Discover. Um, and as of 2016, over 4,000 students got to visit different religious um, worship sites and learn about faiths that weren't their own. Um, and so there was this effort to use different types of policies to implicitly teach about religious pluralism. Um, and if you go to the next slide. Okay, so the case of France is a little more complicated because um, Spain has a lot of regional level governance and France is more centralized. Um, so I'll just touch on this really briefly and we can talk about it in the Q&A. Um, because Alsace Moselle um, was shuffled between Germany and France throughout history several times, um, when France separated Church of State um, in 1905, Alsace Moselle wasn't part of the country. And so they got an exception and their church state relations are still governed by an 1801 agreement um, between Napoleon and different religious organizations. Um, and this included a Jewish organization, two Protestant ones, and the Catholic Church. Um, and so there have been several politicians in Alsace Moselle trying to include Islam um, in these agreements and add that to um, um, their um, offerings of religious education in the public education system, um, in contrast to a purely um, laic um, public education in the rest of France. Um, and so they haven't been successful so far because basically the French government has said this would be an undue burden on the state. And as um, they wanna have as little differentiation as possible um, because over and over um, we've heard French politicians say that laicite or laicism is one of the essential values of the state in their new education curriculum um, on separation of church and state, um, they basically include this principle almost on the same level as egalité, fraternité, liberté, the motto of France. And so um, it's, a, it's really important and a very much a contested term as we'll talk more about in the next panel. Um, okay, you can go to the next slide. Great, um, so thank you so much. As both of these cases illustrate church-state relations is a lot more complicated than those broad national level models when we look at the um, subnational level. Um, and so church state relations, secular and the secular clerical divide over time um, have created this historical foundation that really leaves a lasting impact on how subnational um, political elites are able to construct an identity that distinguishes from them from the state and also try to get um, more authority over issues that really deeply matter to communities and building identity like education and immigrant integration. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. And I'm gonna share this next presentation screen. Okay. Hello everybody. And I'm happy that I could present here today. And today I'll be discussing the unreligious religious rhetoric of Islamophobia in Western Europe. And for that, I'll be examining the um, intersectionality of weaponizing um, Christianity or the reclaiming of Christianity as a part of national identities in Western Europe um, in an attempt 
to implicitly further the um, us against STEM fight um, surrounding the increase of nationalism in the face of the increased presence of Islam um, within Western Europe. And to better understand this, I explore the history of Christianity in Western Europe relating to national identity and citizenship, focusing on France later in my presentation, and how this deeply ingrained uh, relationship between Christianity and nationality exists, but we've noticed a decrease in active practice of Christians in Western Europe. But as Stephanie noted, that doesn't, that doesn't mean that the um, relationship doesn't exist. It's more implicit rather than explicit um, as it was um, before. Start off, I'm going to provide a brief history on Christianity in Western Europe and how you could roughly divide Christianity into three broad divisions within Europe, with Roman Catholicism being in the West and Southwest, Protestantism in the North and the UK, and Eastern Orthodoxy in the East and Southeast. And for a more, or like a further, division of Christianity in Europe, there are two schisms. Um, first being the divide of the Roman Empire into Western and Eastern parts, with the Western part of the empire adhering to Roman Catholicism and the Eastern part adhering to Eastern Orthodoxy. And then later, um, the further divide within Western Europe and parts of Central Europe with um, the Protestant Reformation and which found most success in Northern Germany, Scandinavia, Netherlands, and Germanic speaking areas of Britain. To better understand the nationalism that exists in Western Europe, especially within uh, more um, homogenous, ethnic, ethnically homogenous um, countries within Western Europe. Um, it's important to note that the nationalism that has seen an increase um, in prevalence within these countries are is ethno-nationalism, which is a form of nationalism that creates a exclusatory in-group that excludes a uh, out group or a foreign group, which is typically done on the basis of ethnic, religious, and racial um, identity. And this ethno nationalism is important to highlight when discussing the Islamophobia that has increased within Western Europe as um, the Muslim community has been, is considered a part of the out group because of the ethno-religious identity of being Muslim. And um, for this here, these are just some quotes within this segment of um, individuals who are discussing their aversion or apprehension to the increase in the presence of mosques within Western European countries, um, noting that it doesn't adhere to their um, social norms, often utilizing terminology that is exclusatory by saying um, the Muslims or not adhering to our culture or with it doesn't belong within countries like ours. So I don't want to spend too much time reading them. But so and 
The one that I would like to read though, or like emphasize is the last one. So the next slide, which is from a Dutch anthropologist who notes that um, having, allowing there to be um, mosques within Western European countries allows um, Muslims within those countries to have a sense of belonging um, within countries that they are often excluded from, which is due in part to ethno-nationalism and how this feeling of belonging is important and relates to something I discussed later on, which is um, how creating an environment of inclusion can work to decrease the um, presence of indoctrinization into extremist ideology within Muslim youth in Western Europe. So I just thought it was important to put his quote here. So I utilize France as the focus of this um, intersectionality and in this section, I focus, so first I highlight France's um, history of Catholicism, then I move on to um, addressing its, the history of religious persecution in France um, by highlighting um, anti-Semitism within France and then moving on to Islamophobia. Okay, so France, historically the um, state religion of France was Catholicism and this started to see like a shift in um, this history um, with the French Revolution, which marked the first, though it wasn't permanent, um, divide between church and state. And this quote, which notes that prior to the French Revolution, full membership of the state was denied to Protestant and Jewish minorities. So being French effectively meant being Catholic which is important when examining France's, um, the anti-Semitic history um, within France, as it shows that um, there has been like a long history of ethno-nationalism in that um, religion, one's religious, um, the religion that one identified as um, being a part of often determine their um, validity as being French. So Catholicism, though it's the majority religion in France, has noticed a decline within um, attendance of mass with only 4.5% of Catholics attending mass. And on the next slide are some graphs and statistics from the Pew Research Center of this, like, of the um, attendance and um, just how, um, how active Catholics are in Europe, focusing on Spain, Germany, France, and Italy. And then on the next slide, this is, so I'm gonna discuss anti-Semitism in this part. So starting off with um, the Catholic Church's involvement in anti-Semitism within um, France and noting that many Catholic leaders and institutions were vocally anti-Semitic in the decades leading up to World War II and many supported the Vichy regime. 
which collaborated with the Nazi government and was culpable in the deaths of roughly 75,000 French Jews. So currently the Catholic Church has um, worked to mitigate the anti-Semitic rhetoric within the church and um, within its um, practitioners. However, noting the um, decline in attendance and decline in like, explicit influence of the Catholic Church, um, it hasn't been as effective um, as noted by the hate crimes that I later discuss. And then for politics, I wanted to focus on Okay, so for politics, I wanted to just focus on um, Jean-Marie Le Pen, who started the Jeanne committees, as well as National Rally, which are two parties that are known for anti-globalist, anti-immigrant, anti-Zionist, and Eurosceptic um, ideology. And he has been convicted for espousing um, rhetoric that downplays the Holocaust. And, and has been fined for remarks inciting discrimination against Muslims in France. And I wanted to note that as his daughter, Marine Le Pen was um, in the running for presidency against um, Emmanuel Macron. And it's, it showed that even though the party has separated itself from some of Jean-Marie Le Pen's ideology, it still espouses anti-immigrant and ethno-nationalistic um, rhetoric and often um, utilizes um, Catholicism as being, I, being a part of French identity um, as opposed to um, other religions. And then um, for hate crimes, I wanted to highlight the desecration of Jewish graveyards that has occurred in recent years in France. And these are just some ex three examples. There are a lot more occurrences and it seems as though there's an occurrence at least once every year. And there was an increase within 2010s of um, the desecration of Jewish graves. And for the 2019 one, that's the one that I was most aware of um, as we discussed it in my AP Euro class in high school. And that led me to having an interest in um, looking into the anti-Semitic history of France. And with that, now shifting from anti-Semitism in France um, and providing like the history of religious persecution um, in France, I wanted to focus on the main focus of my um, research, which is Islamophobia in France. And to start off, I wanna discuss um, Emmanuel Macron, the president of France, and how there has been a noticeable shift in his support of the Muslim community um, in recent months. Um, and it has been noticed that it's shifting as it's getting closer to um, the election period and how he has insi like, insisted that Islam is in crisis and that he will liberate it from foreign influence, um, which was a response made 
after the murder of Samuel Patti by Islamic extremists. And this statement often, this statement ties into um, the idea of white saviorism, as well as um, creating an environment of criminalizing Islam for the actions of extremists. And it was noted that after the murder of Samuel Patti, that there were, was an increase in hate crimes um, against the Muslim community, especially Muslim women. And with hijabi women having their um, hijabs pulled off in public and um, being exposed to um, both racist and Islamophobic remarks. And then for laws, there's the separation of church and state in France and how this has led to um, the French law banning religious symbols in public schools, which is similar to the US um, law where um, prayer can't be forced in public schools. However, this law has had um, issues and it's often referred to as the French headscarf ban due to its banning of um, the kimar which is worn by many Muslim women as part of um, hijab. And though the law doesn't explicitly target the Islamic faith, it primarily affects the Muslim community as um, other communities, whether it's the Jewish or Christian community, don't, um, within France, it's not as frequent to see um, them wearing head um, religious headwear, even though um, certain um, individuals within that faith, those faiths will do so in adhering with Orthodox law. And the Shi community has actively worked to um, prevent or to allow the preservation of wearing headwear. And the law has flaws in the fact that it's left up to interpretation of principles and how they're going to enforce the um, rule within their schools, as well as within France's um, territories, it's focusing more on Mayotte in Africa, which has a 97% um, Muslim population compared to a 3% Christian population. And this, the, the laws of France relating to the wearing of um, um, religious head wear, as well as burkinis and burqas has um, brought concerns within the Muslim community um, European Muslim community recently due to France having the presidency of the Council of the European Union until June 30th of this year, with uh, the Muslim community noting that France's divisive anti-Muslim political discourse will seep dangerously into EU policymaking. And for hate crimes, it has been noted that um, freedom of speech has been weaponized to uh, argue that certain hate crimes are not hate crimes or not at, do not violate um, an individual's right to freedom of religion. And as it adheres to the freedom of expression. And Ali Assad, which I find the part that, some of the parts that I underlined that I find, found to be um, most important 
was when he notes that when it comes to criticizing or mocking Islam and its symbols, the establishment's definition of freedom of expression is universal, absolute, and indisputable. And as well as it's very, it has very little tolerance for criticism of Israel, Israeli policies, and Zionism, which shows a shift in a way of the position of the Jewish community in France, though it's still a marginalized community, the Muslim community has, because of its practices deferring the most from Christian practices, it has been placed further into the outsider group that um, ethno-nationalism creates. And also where he notes that while insisting that Muslims embrace criticism and mockery of what is sacred to them, this is important as it ties into the Charlie Hebdo um, magazine, political um, cartoons and the terrorist attack that occurred in 2015, which I discuss on the next slide. So the attackers, of, the perpetrators of the Charlie Hebdo shooting noted that the magazine's depiction of the Prophet Muhammad, as well as Muslim women, specifically hijabi Muslim women, as being the reason behind their um, terrorist attack. And the shooting resulted in the phrase just be Charlie, which had the original meaning of protection of freedom of speech and freedom of press and unity. However, its meaning has been turned into a slogan of the right and is utilized in France or has been utilized by some individuals within the right in a similar fashion to make America great again in the US. And to close off, I wanted to um, close off with noting how important it is for change to be made. marginalized individuals and communities feel as though they belong within the countries that they reside in, especially in countries that are um, historically ethnically homogenous as having a sense of belonging can create and help assist in decreasing the frequency of doctrinization into extremist ideology, um, similar to how cults target individuals that are emotionally and physically isolated. Extremist organizations do the same thing by weaponizing the political and socioeconomic status of Muslims within Western European countries to and doctrinize um, Muslims, especially Muslim youth into um, extremist organizations. And this is a quote from Macro Berolini, which notes that time and again, we have seen the French authorities use the vague and ill-defined concepts of radicalization or radical Islam to justify the imposition of measures without valid grounds, which risks leading to discrimination in its application against Muslims and other minority groups. This stigmatization must end. Thank you for listening to my presentation. Thank you so much. We have our next speaker. Give me one second to share my screen. Oh. 
Okay. Perfect. Good evening. Thank you, Kellen, for the introduction you did before. And I would like to thank all the organizers of the conference for giving me the opportunity uh, to present my topic. Uh, in this presentation, I would like to focus on a historical paradigm where different religious groups achieved to coexist peacefully in the same cities. I'm referring specifically to the Ottoman Empire, where Muslims, Christians, Jews, Iranian Zoroastrians, uh, and other religious entities lived together in the same space for five centuries with minimal unrest. So we move to the first slide after this. Yes. To the third. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so, um, First, I would uh, show you videographic uh, overview of the physical borders of Europe with Asia, which are the Ural Mountains, the Caspian Sea, Caucasus Mountains, Black Sea, and Hellespont. Next slide, please. Now let's turn to the geography of the Ottoman Empire. As we see in the slide, the Ottoman Empire ruled for five centuries most of uh, Southeastern Europe, Asian Minor and the Near East and directly on their electric uh, influenced historical developments in the wider Eurasian region. So it was founded at the end uh, of the 13th century in Northwest Asia Minor. And uh, in uh, 1354, the Ottomans crossed into Europe and uh, with the conquest of the Balkans, transform it into a transcontinental empire. Under their rule came Turkey, Iran, Egypt, Syria, Tunisia, Algeria, Libya, the Balkans, namely Greece, uh, Turkey, Iran, Egypt, uh, Syria, uh, sorry, Albania, North Macedonia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Bulgaria, Croatia, Montenegro, Romania, Serbia, Slovenia, uh, the so-called Crimea Peninsula, Moldavia, and they reached Vienna in Austria, where they defeated uh, by the Austrians. Next slide, please. Mm, moving on, uh, I would like to look at the socioeconomic uh, structure of the Ottoman Empire uh, with greater detail. The dominant religion in the Ottoman Empire was Islam. However, Christian population, as well as the Jews and the Zoroastrians of Persia, were recognized as protective subjects of the Ottoman Empire and retained their personal and religious freedom and uh, their properties in exchange uh, of the payment uh, of, the, of uh, corporate uh, tax, the Yija, it's Turkish. On the other hand, uh, they do not have uh, institutional equality, um, of course. Uh, in commercial matters, for example, they are not equal before the law. Muslims are not Muslims. So the Ottomans had not stable policy for non-Muslims. Muslims and Christians in the Ottoman Empire shared uh, the same space of life and action. Um, although the districts of the cities tended to be composed mainly of one or, or the other religious group, cases of mixed settlement were not at all uncommon. Uh, and it is of particular interest that the practices of segregation, such as uh, confinement to close quarters, a practice that been used and applied in Italy and elsewhere for Jews, uh, and it's linked to the term ghetto, uh, it's not, uh, uh, it's, it's absent in the Ottoman Empire. So moreover, uh, Christians and Muslims met in common holy, in common holy spaces uh, like Shirns. And uh, we have also the Tekes, uh, the, they are the gathering places of worship of the Dervish orders were sometimes open to not, were sometimes open to non-Muslims because they have the mentality um, that uh, all were connected uh, through a common belief in God. Uh, we move to the next slide, please. Uh, having said that, we turn to the next slide. Uh, and here we see my main argument. 
in uh, Western historiography, the relations between Christians and Muslims uh, were interpreted through the prism of the subjugation of the former to the latter. However, in Greece, there have been found constitutional texts, state documents related to citizens' assemblies, records of elections of local governors, and protocols of cooperation deals. Uh, this fighting suggests not only religious tolerance, but also democratic self-government governance in Greek cities living under the Ottoman rule. We move to the next, please. Having talked about the, the geography of the Ottoman Empire, their socioeconomic structure, and uh, my central argument about the democratic self-governance in Greek cities under the Ottomans, I would like to look at the political structure of those cities in more detail. Okay, uh, first of all, uh, at the head of the administration, we have the Patriarchate, that is uh, the religious representative. They were recognized by the Ottoman sultans as officials and they were rep responsible for the tax collection. However, they were not representatives of their flocks in relation to the authorities, non, uh, nor uh, did they have jurisdiction uh, over their faithful. They were free to, to have their own faithful. Um, the community uh, chose which representative to send to the central authority to negotiate its demands. It wasn't uh, uh, necessarily the ecclesiastical the religious authority. And of course, as in any democracy, the authority had to be accountable to the people. For this reason, church uh, leadership was attributed to the demos. This is the, the, the commons, the assembly of the citizens uh, and its representatives and were subject, subject to their control through the assemblies, as we said. We move to the next slide, please. Now let's turn to a more theoretical division of how the Greeks understood democracy. Uh, a tradition that lasts uh, from anxiety to the end of Ottoman Empire. Of course, in, uh, in ancient Greece, we didn't have a uh, whole type of democracy. We had also tyranny, oligarchy, and, but uh, the idea of democracy were the same uh, till uh, the 19th uh, century. Um, be before we move to the neoliberal democratic system we have right now. So the thing is, so modernity understood the individual freedom as opposed to, to equality, and in any case, as incompatible with so-called collective freedom or political freedom. So uh, they say that individual freedom leads to inequality, okay? Because anyone who is born in a more privileged environment has equal opportunities with someone who is poorer. So this process, uh, due, uh, due to this process, the rich man gets richer and the poorer man has much less chance of getting those privileges, as we saw before um, from Lauren and the, convert, the, the other guy who told them as their stories. But uh, Greeks saw individual freedom as a pre-democratic state. That means that individual freedom is primarily because it is the first uh, to make its appearance in the process of democratization of a society. So having individual freedom, the subjects of the society can decide whether they want autocracy or democracy. This is the first stage of the democra democratic process of it. The completion of the democratic process comes with collective freedom, which is uh, the political freedom. That is the exercise of political control and power through participation in the commons. For example, the demonstration we see now against the Russian inv invasion is a product of collective freedom. Uh, the first characteristic uh, uh, of uh, democracy uh, is the distinction between the state and the political system. So the state is composed uh, of the parliament, which are drawn by lottery in ancient Greece. We didn't have parties. And uh, the judiciary, the central court. Okay. And we don't have executive governments uh, 
because every law passed uh, with the consent of the citizens. The political system, on the other hand, includes the society and its representatives. Society is namely uh, due this process uh, an institution, is an institution that decides whether the law will be in force or not. Uh, so who is the only enemy of democracy? The citizens who wants to overthrow it. Uh, don't take me wrong. <laughs> uh, in ancient Greece, uh, for example, when demagogues and orators uh, who uh, gave the people false expectations where they won their vote and then tyranny came. But be aware, please, that first the elected representatives stop applying the principle of democracy and then the citizens uh, decided to override democracy. So we move to the next slide, please. Uh, now let's turn uh, to the conclusions of my presentation. Uh, so what conclusions can we draw uh, from the Ottoman paradigm, which offers individual freedom and religious tolerance to their subjects? The first hypothesis is historiographical and relates to the picture we have uh, of the socioeconomic development of European countries under Ottoman rule. These countries did not have a feudal despotic system like uh, Western Europe in the late Middle Ages. It was a multi-ethnic, uh, <coughs> so it was a multi-ethnic empire with no stable administrative organization in the co co conquered uh, territories. We move to the next slide, please. The second hypothesis we can generate is associated uh, with community development. Plural societies allow different population groups to live together with minimal bloodshed and compared to the nation uh, states that succeed them, uh, it was a, a remarkable agreement. After, uh, after all, the Ottomans saw plurality as a gain for their empire. In contrast, early modern Europe uh, was shaken by religion wars, uh, uh, between Catholics, Protestants, uh, persecution of non-believers and all kinds of manifestations of uh, intolerance, for example, the witch hunts, uh, resulting, of course, uh, in the extermination or marginalization of uh, uh, religious minorities. Therefore, we see that uh, it is intolerant, it is uh, tolerance, not uh, necessarily assimilation of the minorities uh, to the state religion and organization that has led these religious groups to live peacefully both among themselves and in relation to their uh, overlords. We move to the next slide, please. Uh, the third lesson we can get from the Ottoman period has to do with the coexistence of a democratic organization and religious authority in Hellenic cities. The Ottomans had uh, granted their subjects individual freedom, as I said, thus the, Greek, thus the Greek cities, while maintaining their democratic organization, introduced these organizations to the ecclesiastic, to the religious authorities, um, and uh, through transparency, accountability, and control of power in the commons. We can thus conclude that a community can uh, maintain both an anthropocentric or uh, democratic uh, uh, form of social organization and religious sentiment through individual and collective uh, responsibility for social arrangement and religion. Uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>